Hi, this is Wayne Blasberg. I've lived in New Boston for 24 years and have been a volunteer firefighter for 23 years. This is part one of a two-part presentation. The presentation deals with the requirements for a fire station to service the needs of the community and to better serve the 50 plus members that make up the department. This presentation moves between slides quickly. If you wish to spend more time studying a slide, you may pause the movie presentation by clicking the pause icon at the bottom of the page. The icon is shown here. You then restart by clicking the start icon. Presentation overview. These are the topics that will be addressed in this presentation. Why now? Deficiencies. Options. Renovate versus building new. Recommended solution and why. Proposed design. Financial impact and safety. Background. Why now? The idea for a new station started in 2007. The station requirements were developed and a plan with design documentation was created. The project required sufficient land to be able to develop a plan and design a structure to fit the site. A few plots of land were available in research, but the town wasn't in a position to acquire them. In 2012, Tebow's land, Route 13 North, became available and put in front of the town, but the vote failed. After the failed vote, the fire station plans were put on hold. In 2014, the town purchased three plus acres on Route 13 South. The fire wards asked to be allowed to use the land to develop a plan for a new fire station. The selectmen agreed. The new station planning and design was relaunched mid-2014. The current documentation with analysis and plans were created during the years 2015 and 2016. Today's deficiencies. Insufficient apparatus base space. Insufficient equipment storage. Insufficient office and training space. No apparatus exhaust system. No hot and cold areas. No decontamination area. No showers. No on-site gear washing equipment. Limited parking space. Difficult and expensive to expand. These deficiencies will be elaborated on during the presentation. Apparatus bays. Undersized vehicle bays and doors cause restrictions to what vehicles can access the space. Most mutual aid vehicles will not fit into our station, risking no covered trucks in winter. Equipment storage and staff lockers obstruct movement within the bays. Apparatus length and height is limited. Areas between the apparatus is small and not adequate for training and a diesel exhaust system would further reduce this space. These are photos of the overhead doors shown in the background. First bay is looking at ambulance one from back to front and there appears to be about a foot clearance. This is acceptable. Second bay, this photo is looking from back to front of engine one and the clearance between the deck gun and the ladder rack is measured in inches. Third bay is looking from back to front of engine two and the clearance between its deck gun and ladder rack is also measured in inches. These overhead doors will not accommodate the size of most mutual aid apparatus that come to cover the station. During good weather, this is not a problem, but during winter, the mutual aid companies will want their apparatus in the station so as not to freeze and be rendered inoperable. This slide speaks to the width of the aisles. The photo top left is the first aisle as you enter the station. This aisle is about 24 inches wide and everyone pretty much has to rub along the hanging fire gear. The photo top right is the second aisle and is 5 to 6 feet wide. This aisle is not conducive to an acceptable training area and will become more restrictive if and when we add a vehicle exhaust system. More on this later in the presentation. The photo bottom left is the third aisle and has all the same issues as the previous aisle. The bottom right photo fourth aisle is pretty much unusable because it stores our breakfast tables and chairs. This is an overhead drawing of the first floor apparatus bay which is 48 feet by 60 feet or 2880 square feet. You can see how tight everything is. This is an overhead drawing of the second floor showing the small 560 square foot meeting and training room. During our monthly business meetings people overflow and stand in the kitchen. Insufficient space. In addition to the lack of apparatus base space, there are many other areas that are lacking sufficient space. Previously mentioned, lack of adequate training and meeting space causes many members to stand during meetings. Lack of secure storage space for things like medications and new gear. PPE, or personal protective equipment, is stored in the Bay Area and is subject to damage from diesel fumes, heat, moisture, etc. 
Medical supplies are currently stored in the apparatus bay where the diesel exhaust can harm them as well. When we swap our truck summer tires for winter tires, storage for the off-season tires is scarce. The next group of slides deals with the 43-year-old structure and the one-third acre lot. A little bit of trivia here. The original open house for the fire station was November 10, 1973. The items researched. Floodplain. Can the building flood? Structure. What's the building's condition? Sprinklers. Are they up to code? Septic. 43 years and shared. Market value. What's the building's market value and why is it necessary? Stormwater. Can the runoff be contained? Fire inspection. Is the building up to code? Safety committee's position. Resources used. These are the people that contributed to the data collection covered in this presentation. Bob Todd is the surveyor used for the floodplain analysis. Bob Brecknock is a structural engineer used to analyze the building's condition. Kevin Leonard is the civil engineer used to analyze the septic and stormwater issues. Doug Martin is the commercial realtor used to determine the market value. Jennifer Gilbert is our contact with the state to determine the current floodplain level. Roger Dignard is the architect and the major contributor in developing our plan. Without Roger's knowledge and expertise, there would not be the same accuracy and confidence we have in the cost of building or renovating that we have. Roger donated all of his time. Matt Bolio is a construction project manager and worked to develop the materials list for the new proposed structure and worked with the contractors. From the information received, Matt developed the costing model seen later in this presentation. Matt is also the supervisor slash project manager who managed the construction of the Whipple Free Library. Mike Franklin is the service manager for John Carter who researched the initial sprinkler system installation. Fred Hayes and Peter Flynn assisted Wayne with developing the financial models. Eric DeBowick is the new Boston fire inspector who did the life safety inspection and created the report that was used to determine safety compliance. The project team consisted of Wayne Blasberg chaired the committee, and the team members were Selectman Joe Constance, Roger Dignard, Matt Bolio, Ken Lombard, Scott Hunter, Amy Welch, and Dan McDonald. Without the hard work and dedication of these folks, this design and plan could not have been accomplished. Floodplain. Jennifer Gilbert from FEMA provided us with the BFE base flood elevation for the center of town. The BFE is 416.5 feet above sea level. Bob Todd's survey measured the floor of the fire station to be 418.4 feet. The New Boston Ordinance states that we need to be two feet above the BFE, which we are, so by regulation, the station is not in the flood zone. Slide 16, floodplain survey map. This slide is a portion of the floodplain survey that Bob Todd provided us. The fire station is the rectangle in the center of the frame. The 416 foot mark is circled in red towards the top right and the 418.4 foot mark shown is inside the station. The next few pictures are of the Mother's Day flood from 2007. This picture shows the water level between 416 and 417 feet elevation. This picture shows the water level at the 418 foot elevation and close to coming into the station. This is a shot out behind the fire station. You can see the station and the community church with water between them. The lot behind the station is in the foreground where the proposed addition would be and is completely underwater. This shot is looking out a fire station window towards the church. Halfway between the buildings is the shared septic system that is completely submerged. This is unacceptable for an emergency services facility. This picture was provided by Jennifer Gilbert from FEMA and shows the proposed site of the new fire station. The BFE is 422.3 feet and the site where the fire station is planned is 434 feet, more than 10 feet above the BFE a very safe elevation above the base flood elevation. Structural survey.
Structural engineer Bob Brecknock performed a preliminary partial inspection of the existing framing at the station on June 3, 2016. Results of the inspection are summarized here. Number 1. Existing roof truss diagonals at two locations in every truss require lateral bracing. Number 2. Hurricane ties at the end of every roof truss are required. Number 3. Truss steel connection plates appear to be smaller than in current roof truss designs and should be analyzed to determine if reinforcement is required. Number 4. New steel portal frames are required in the front wall to resist wind slash seismic lateral loads. Number 5. All exterior studs supporting roof trusses need to be reinforced. Number 6. Reinforcement of top plates under roof trusses are required if the plates are double ply. Number 7. Reinforcement of the triple 2x12 beam in the interior section of the building is required. The next slide shows a photo of this beam. It's Bob's opinion that an in-depth analysis of the complete building, including seismic and wind loading, will likely result in multiple additional requirements for reinforcement. Slide 23. This photo shows the triple 2x12 beam that Bob said needs reinforcement. In reference to the next slide, this photo shows that there is no fire rated material on the ceiling that would create a one hour fire separation between the garage where this photo was taken and the training slash meeting room on the second floor. Fire inspection. The fire inspector, Eric DeBoek, found many violations, but these two really stood out. First is the one hour fire separation that was non-existent as demonstrated in the previous photo. Second issue is both exits from the meeting slash training room are violations. Both exit paths from the second floor need to access directly outside and meet a one hour fire rating. Both exits currently go through hazardous areas and do not meet the one hour fire rating. The front exit goes through a vehicle bay and the second exit goes through an electrical service area. Safety Committee Position Per the fire inspector, the safety committee meets periodically and has reviewed the safety concerns brought forward by the fire inspector. The safety committee supports our moving forward with, the mitigating, with mitigating the safety concerns noted above as well as our air quality concerns and hazardous conditions. Slide 25 shows the back stairway that's in violation due to the electrical boxes shown as well as not being one hour fire rated and not going directly to the outside. Sprinkler Compliance Mike Franklin, service manager for John L. Carter Sprinkler Company, reviewed the paperwork on file for our sprinkler installation. What I found is that when we were asked to quote the installations for this building, the town specified use of non-listed and undersized water supplies for the sprinkler system. The town also specified what size pumps to use. The specified pumps are not listed fire pumps and do not have the capacity to supply the sprinkler system to NFPA 13 standards. Per Mike, these systems have never been NFPA 13 compliant systems. Septic and stormwater findings, Kevin Leonard, floodplain. With the building being built at the same elevation as the existing fire station, the facility is subject to being flooded around. This is not a great characteristic in citing an emergency services facility. Stormwater runoff. Filling in the existing depression to raise the elevation of the pad is required for the proposed addition. By doing this, you are filling flood storage and should really be considering compensatory storage in the vicinity. This may not be easy to achieve given the scarcity of land in the area. The regulation states any rainwater that falls on a property needs to remain on that property. If we were to fill in the backlot depression and add on to the station which would extend onto the backlot, it would be extremely difficult if not impossible to achieve no rainwater runoff onto abutters properties given the limited land in the area. Civil engineer findings continued. Holding tank. Floor drain flows and decontamination wastewater when municipal sewer is not available would be plumbed to holding tanks that were registered with the New Hampshire DES. Waste would be hauled off site as needed and would not connect to septic system. What Kevin explained here is the proper way to handle the wastewater. What we currently have are three floor drains in the apparatus bay that catch everything on the floor including any oil and grease from the trucks. 
This then flows into the drains and winds up in the holding tank in front of the station and then this waste flows into the river. This system was installed in 1973. Kevin's summary. The short answer is, I think you can make something work here from a septic perspective. Septic is one hurdle to expand here, but it seems there would be other deficiencies or conditions at this site that would weigh in as well. Code requirement calculation. This slide explains where the line is between having to bring an entire building up to code or not. The current building has an internal first floor footprint of 94 feet by 48 feet and a second floor of 24 feet by 48 feet totaling 5,664 square feet. The code states that if the renovation involves more than 50% of the aggregate building area then the entire building needs to be brought up to current day codes. 50% of 5,664 square feet is 2,832 square feet. The proposed building renovation, excluding the additions listed below, easily exceeds 2,832 square feet, thereby requiring the entire building be brought up to current day code. Other concerns. Our floor drains have no water and oil separation. They run off into a pit in front of the station and then into the river. This is a significant EPA violation. Stormwater runoff will be a major challenge on such a small lot. We exceed the 50% rule, requiring the building be brought up to current ADA requirements, including an $80,000 elevator needing three-phase power. This lot will be difficult, if not impossible, to expand in the future if and when the fire department goes full-time and we need to add dorms and other rooms. Inability to increase overhead apparatus bay door size. Current door size is 10 feet by 12 feet. The standard in the fire service is 14 feet by 14 feet. Fire equipment manufacturers charge a premium purchase price for non-standard smaller size trucks to fit through our small doors. Adding truck traffic on Mill Street based on the new renovation design is viewed as a concern. We also believe being in the center of town will be a disadvantage in 10 to 20 years given future traffic patterns and the potential for congestion. The building will be very difficult to sell given the numerous code violations and the cost to bring the structure into compliance, along with the shared septic system and no on-site well. This is the end of the first part of the presentation. Please watch and listen to the second part. It talks about the cost of both renovating and building new and what it will cost you. There are conceptual site and building drawings that show the proposed new fire station and much more. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please contact Wayne using the information provided. Thank you very much.